So thank you, welcome and thank you for joining us today for this virtual side event to the 57th session of the Commission on Population De and Development. My name is Marion Starkey and I'm the Vice President for Communications at Population Connection. Today's panel, Population Health and Environment, the Importance of Drawing PHE Links to Close Funding Gaps, will address the international family planning funding shortfalls since the 1994 Program of Action was adopted 30 years ago. Panelists will demonstrate that making the case for the environmental benefits of increased access to voluntary family planning has the potential to increase national and donor family planning budgets. We'll hear first from Dr. Karen Hardy, who will present a new report that she co-wrote called Breaking Silos, Ending the Silence on Population and Reproductive Health and Rights. We'll then hear from Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, who will talk about the organization she founded and runs in Uganda called Conservation for Public Health, through public health, um, which uses a population health and environment or PHE model. And finally, hopefully, we'll be hearing from Margaret Edison, who will talk about the demographic challenges that Nigeria faces and how increased access to family planning could help alleviate population pressures there. She actually is currently in another meeting and we're hoping that she'll be able to join us shortly. Um, so this, org this event is hosted by three like-minded organizations, um, Population Matters in the UK and Population Connection and Population Media Center in the US. And before I introduce our first speaker, I'd just like to give each of the hosting organizations a minute to introduce their work and their organizations. And since I'm already talking, I'll start with Population Connection. So we are an education and advocacy NGO based in the United States in Washington, DC. We are a membership-based organization, so we have 40,000 dues-paying members who support the organization on an annual basis. That's our funding. We don't get any funding from the U.S. government. Um, our population education program works mainly with K-12 through teachers, um, building lesson plans and other curriculum um, materials for them to use in their classrooms or in their um, non-traditional education settings. Um, we estimate that we reach approximately 3 million students a year with these lesson plans, helping to improve students' population literacy. We are the only grassroots organization in the United States whose primary advocacy focus is increasing international family planning funding, permanently ending harmful U.S. policies that affect funding to UNFPA and to clinics overseas that don't meet the criteria of the global gag rule, also known as the Mexico City policy and ending the Helms Amendment, which prohibits US foreign assistance from being used for safe abortion services. So if you'd like to hear more about us, learn more about us, visit our website at populationconnection.org. And now I would like to invite Florence Blondell to introduce Population Matters. And when she's finished, Cody Peluso will introduce Population Media Center. Uh, thank you so much, Marianne. Welcome everyone. My name is Florence Blondell and I work as a content and campaigns specialist uh, Population Matters is a UK-based global charity that advocates for achieving a sustainable population to safeguard our environment and empower individuals to lead fulfilling lives. While unchecked population growth hinders progress towards a world where everyone thrives, it's merely one piece of the complex puzzle that we face. Our focus on population isn't singular. It's because, it's because addressing the issue unlocks solutions which have immediate benefits for people today. Reinforcing the words of Liu Zhenyun, uh, UN Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, rapid population growth makes eradicating poverty, combating hunger and malnutrition, and increasing the coverage of health and education systems more difficult. However, the burden of this challenge isn't equally shared. It disproportionately impacts young girls and women. When their needs are not met, it creates a ripple effect, hindering progress on all sustainable development goals. In essence, Neglecting the well-being of women and girls undermines our efforts to achieve any of, of the SDGs. And that's why population care, population matters cares so much about you know, achieving women's and girls' rights. And we do that in many ways, supporting grassroots projects through our Empower to Plan project, uh, delivering sexual and productive health and rights, uh, gathering stakeholders to discuss the issues triggering a wider conversation and identify the right solutions for them, as we did just a couple of weeks ago in Nigeria and in 2022 uh, population conversation in Kenya, in Nairobi, uh, campaigning and working with partners to tackle the barriers as we've just started in India regarding girls' education, 
amplifying voices from marginalized communities, including by supporting youth activists. And we had some attend CPD 56 last year, COPE 28, and even Women Deliver Conference in Rwanda last year, and also exposing and campaigning against the threat to reproductive rights and gender equality posed by pronatal governments and politicians. We also provide information to a global online audience about the value of smaller families in the high impact affluent countries. And of course, we promote sustainable consumption. Echoing everyone else that will be talking today, let's call for an increase in funding. Thank you so much. Over to you, Cody. Thank you. My name is Cody Peluso, and I work for Population Media Center. We are a global NGO working in entertainment education based in the United States, but we work across the world in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the United States. I'm going to show you a, a quick clip from one of our TV dramas in the United States called East Los High. And you may be wondering what dramas, whether they're radio novellas or TV shows, has to do with population, but I'll get into that after I show you the clip. East Los is my home. This is a great opportunity. You lied to me. No, I didn't. I'm out. We're going on a date tonight. You ratted me out? I was trying to save you. You shouldn't even be in this competition, let alone this country. Oh, you can't talk to my dancers like that. The song was made for you when you'll never be like me. So like I said, we make entertainment education to challenge social norms around patriarchy, the rights of women and girls, issues like child marriage and FGM, gender-based violence, because we know that these are the root issues of unsustainable population growth. We've worked in over 50 countries, and when we do so, we see impact changing in the way both communities and individuals operate when it comes to behaviors on family planning, sexual and reproductive health and gender-based violence, among many other issues. And so we believe when we can challenge social norms, especially patriarchal norms, we can challenge population growth and we could help entire communities and the globe be a happier, healthier, and more equitable place. Thank you. Thanks, both of you. Okay, so I would like to introduce our first panelist, um, which is Dr. Karen Hardy, who's the president of Hardy Associates. She's been a social demographer for over 30 years and has extensive technical and leadership experience working with a range of bilateral and multilateral development organizations and as a consultant on family planning and reproductive health, rights-based programming, gender, global development and climate change, policy and program development, research and evaluation. And she was previously a director at the Center for Research and Evaluation at the Futures Group, now called Palladium, a visiting senior fellow at Population Reference Bureau, the vice president for research at PAI, a senior advisor at JSI, the principal research scientist at Family Health International, now, now called FHI 360, and a presidential management fellow at USAID and the Census Bureau, the US Census Bureau. Um, Dr. Hardy has worked globally, most intensively in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. She holds a PhD from Cornell University's Population and Development Program and has published extensively and spoken widely. Um, and I would encourage you, if you have questions during Dr. Hardy's presentation or any of the webinar today, to please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll see the little speech bubbles, and if you click that, it will open a, a, a box where you can enter your questions, and we will see them there and get to them at the end of the presentations. Okay, thank you very much. Karen, go ahead. All right, are you, um, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Let me get it on. Oops. And then you want to put it in slideshow mode? I know, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> There. Thank you. Thank you so Under much. And really, gosh, thank the Population Matters, Population Connection, and, and Population Media Center. Um, for, gosh, for all the wonderful work that, that you guys all do and, um, uh, and for hosting, hosting this, this event and for inviting me. I'm, I'm on behalf, I, I would like to uh, sort of talk about this uh, report that we've written on behalf of my, of my, of my colleagues. And um, and I just want to say that uh, in writing this, we uh, first of all brought our passion about SRHR and population and the environment and our, you know, just desire to 
to to link these things and to and to sort of get rid of all of the the sort of net some some negativity around some of the terms. And uh, I I was just introduced, so you know my background. But um, Celine Delacroix is a, a, an a academic um, in Quebec, um, but also the um, the the director of um, Family Planning Earth, and um, and so she brings that perspective. And has done a lot of really interesting research, and some, including some I'll, I'll actually talk about today. Um, and Joe Spidell has, oh my goodness, he, um, uh, you know, was the director of USAID's Office of Population uh, and, and Reproductive Health, and he's also been the president of PAI, so a donor of Population Action International PAI, so more of the advocacy side. He's been an academic, he's, uh, at, uh, he's a professor emeritus at Berkeley in their population program, um, and he's also an MD. So we, um, I, we, we're hope, we hope we bring sort of that rounded um, uh, background in sort of addressing, addressing these, these issues. Um, and so just to say that uh, I, there's a lot of data in this report, and I'm not going to take the time to go into that level of detail, but I just wanted to sort of share our, our key messages. And that is that we really think that disassociating uh, or delinking the topic of population dynamics from sexual reproductive health and rights um, misses a really uh, big opportunity to advance, to actually advance reproductive health and, and reproductive justice in a rights-based in a rights-based way, um, as my as my colleague uh, Karen Newman and, and some of her colleagues say, you can care about SRHR and population at the same time. Um, and we also feel that this really and we, uh, make the make the case that it downplays the relevance of both population dynamics and SRHR for broader societal goals, including um, the positive impact on environmental sustainability. And the report has a lot of data on, on environmental sustain. Whoops, whoops, too fast. Um, previous, yikes. There we go. Um, just that uh, the report also makes the point that population considerations can be constructively added to um, several um, uh, frameworks um, into SRHR, but and also into and we're talking today about population health and environment framework, but there's also the One Health framework, there's the SDG framework, there's the reproductive justice framework. There are just so many frameworks that uh, population dynamics and SRHR can be can be really constructively added into, and that this really represents. Um, you 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 heard earlier um, with our the, our th the three organizations who are supporting this work that. Um, uh, the, there's just big funding shortfalls for SRHR. Um, and so we really think that the really productively linking uh, population and SRHR uh, gives an opportunity to, to increase the spotlight on these issues and also then funding. Um, and that we all, as we all know, SRHR is chronically underfunded and, uh, and under acknowledged. So just in a nutshell, those are sort of the main, main points that we make. Um, and uh, I think it's important. I mean, here we are, um, so, uh, and it's, it's, it's Cairo plus 30, ICPD plus, plus 30. Um, and I, I just think it's important to, that we take a look back at ICPD and what the program of action actually says. And we know that, um, that uh, ICPD Cairo was really a celebration of really focusing on sexual reproductive health and rights and that Cairo repudiated demographic targets um, on providers, um, but it did not uh, s s you know, say there should be no attention to population dynamics. In fact, it said that uh, population dynamics are a completely legitimate um, focus of governments. They just can't be the, the, the focus, they just can't be then, that can't be translated into um, population or targets for providers. Um, and uh, so the Cairo consensus really was, in fact, that um, we needed to facilitate the demographic transition, which is attention to population dynamics, but that that needed to be done in the context of providing voluntary family planning in the context of, re of reproductive health, which is how, what we now sort of know as SRHR. 
and that we needed to improve maternal and child health outcomes and really focus on empowering women um, and protecting human rights, individuals' human rights. And to do this in the context of um, broad participation in policy development, um, notably participation of, of women and youth in the deliberations. So this, um, in a nutshell, is really what the program of action focused on. And so we really think that the narrative that ICPD is, is only about SRHR really limits the potential of, um, of ICPD and that this is something that's worth reflecting on 30 years later, because I think we all agree that ICPD, um, you know, it's, it, 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 uh, it, it's still serving us well as a framework, but we're saying, look, let's look at the whole framework, not just the SRHR aspects of it. Um, so of course, um, we know that uh, the population growth rates are going down and sort of what we hear is, oh, you know, populations imploding and, and uh, you know, the terrible, terrible doom and gloom. Um, but in fact, the, we can also see because of population momentum that po the world population, yes, the growth rate's going down, but that the, uh, the number of people in the world is, is still, is can continue to go up for several decades. Um, but of course, that's uneven across regions with uh, the fastest, um, in fact, most population growth, you know, in the next decades is really going to be um, sort of fueled by population growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then we also know that this uh, is exacerbating challenges to sustainable development, um, but also to the, to the environment. I mean, we've heard a lot about, and there's a lot of data in our report about just the effect of, of population numbers um, you know, on the environment. But this is also um, happening in a context where there's going to be um, a need to, to support improved um, standards of living for the, for the billions of people who are still living, living in poverty. So, um, so it's important to, to have uh, you know, everybody really understand what these po population dynamics are actually saying. Um, the, we got a lot of data from the UN. Uh, they do, do population projections, of course, and their, their latest um, report from 20, 2022 um, basically made a couple of, of interesting points that sort of get a little bit lost. And that is we sort of think that the we everybody's heard of the median term projection from the UN and, and people sort of take that as that's absolutely what's going to happen, um, that that sort of that those trajectories are, are immutable. Um, but what the uh, UN Population Division also says that that actually, if we have lower population growth than the median variant, um, there it while there won't be sort of a much of an impact in the short term, there the cumulative effect of lower fertility that if it's maintained over se over several decades could have a substantial effect on um, you know particularly in the second half of this century. Um, but they also, another key message they have is that sustained high fertility and rapid, rapid population growth presents challenges um, to sustainable development, to achieving the SDGs, particularly related to health, you know, the, the, the topics that we're, that we're so interested in, education, gender, um, and, that, um, and, it's, it's, uh, and, and that if we can reach the SDGs, um, it'll, that'll also hasten um, probably uh, low, transition towards lower fertility um, in countries with, with high levels of, of fertility. Um, so I think the point that we're trying to make in the report is we should really consider this low variant um, as a feasible alternative um, and, that, and that we know that we can do that through increased investment in women, in, uh, in education, and in SRHR. Um, and so we think, again, this is sort of making that link between SRHR and population dynamics, um, you know, is important. Um, I think some of you have probably already seen this, this quote from Dr. Musimbi Kanyoro, who's the former president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women. Um, and at the time she, she, she said this, she was uh, at the Packard Foundation as a, as a donor. Um, and uh, this, this was, um, I was actually at this, uh, the reason I like to show this quote is that I was at a meeting of the NGO forum you know, at, at Cairo plus 15, I think it was. Um, and she was making the point that where's, you know, where's the P in ICPD? And, and you know, she sort of said, 
nobody nobody doubts the value of em empowering women but um you know but basically if population grows as quickly very quickly it's uh you know it's women and girls who suffer first um and who suffered most and um the thing that really struck me is as she was making this statement about where's the p and icpd she was booed by the ngo advocates and i was just i just couldn't believe that um but uh, anyway, um, you know, this is a survey that um, Celine uh, Delacroix did um, uh, with, with a colleague, a Ghanaian colleague, um, Atiki uh, Aou, in 2023. And they did a survey, an online survey of, uh, of uh, sort of st stakeholders across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they got about 42 countries, um, mostly Ethiopia, but still a, a range of countries. Um, you know, to see to see what um, you know African stakeholders are saying about population dynamics, and SRHR and the environment, and what they found is, I mean, there were of course a range of views, and some people who sort of said, you know, don't talk about population, just uh, you know, leave it leave it alone, it doesn't matter, and you know, but uh, but but among most of the respondents, they really found that there is a deep concern for population growth. Um, and that uh, the, that was perceived as uh, very um, strongly linked to environmental issues, to uh, you know, to sort of climate change, so, uh, social goals, food security. Um, so they really did see the links, um, and that they also uh, sort of said, mostly not everybody, of course, but with that in integrating family planning as a component of environmental policies um, would be would be. A constructive thing, and it would it would um, accelerate progress towards achieving reproductive health and rights um, in the sort of in the context of the of the SDGs. They also said that um, they that uh, there's sort of, there's a feeling that there's really an underrepresentation of African voices in the sort of international discussions about environmental governance. Um, I think even the same thing about climate change. Um, and that uh, the population dynamic should actually be given more weight in international meetings and uh, sort of acknowledging right now that it's it sort of um, <clears throat> mostly avoided as a taboo and, and too sensitive topic. Um, so I'm part of a, of a group that it's, it's that we're called the um, PHE Policy and Practice Group. And sort of in reaction to just very negative um, framing of population, I mean, it seems like, you know, when the word, when you hear the word population, the next, that the next word that comes out of somebody's mouth is control as though, you know, everything related to population is, is, is population control. And we're trying to say that, you know, that really is not the case. Um, and then we said when people everywhere obviously can exercise bodily autonomy exert, uh, you know, have reproductive autonomy um, through the realization of universal access to SRHR, you know, and make sure their births are planned and that, um, but that, and that all of those are fantastic things for, for individual rights and should absolutely be in place. But that when that happens, um, you know, for the most part, that can result in slower population growth, which then again can um, contribute to long-term reduction in uh, demogra demographic shifts. Um, and also we said that disparaging contraception and family planning runs counter to achieving um, universal access to SRHR. So what we say is that, you know, let's highlight and celebrate the, these cascading benefits of access to SRHR. Of course, the, the primary benefit is to the individual and that's where that's, of course, where the where the focus should be, um, but that that ha does have if the universal access to SRHR has obviously benefits to the individual, for women, for families, for communities, for the nation and the planet, um, and so let's uh, let's celebrate that. Um, strategic recommendations. Um, uh, we have six six recommendations in the report that just the need to acknowledge the links between these topics. Um, and educate the po policymakers and the public about them so that there's, uh, you know, there's, and, and kudos to all of the organizations who, who are sponsoring this because that's exactly what you guys do and we need more of it. Um, and rather than siloed funding, um, let's try to, let's look for funding that can include SRHR in environment, SRHR in climate funding. 
um, uh, you know, and, and population dynamics and all of those, uh, those things also. Um, uh, you know, getting and getting communities of, of, of interest, the SRHR communities of interest, environmental in, um, communities of interest, climate change, just all these different, um, you know, youth, youth communities of interest, engaging them in, in engaging in this topic. Um, of course, adopting needed policies, laws and policies, both at the, at the national, but also at the, at the global level and providing adequate funds and particularly um, closing the shortfall um, uh, in the $5 billion uh, of funding that, in the, that that's the gap um, in, in uh, getting to funding universal, universal access to SRHR. Uh, so that was a very quickly um, in a nutshell, and there's a lot more, um, a lot more in in the report. So I commend it to you, um, and um, happy looking forward to other presentations and and to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, we're already getting a lot of feedback in the Q and A box, so people have questions that we will pose to you after Gladys's presentation. So thanks so much right. for that. Okay, um, so on to our next speaker. Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka is the founder and CEO of Conservation Through Public Health. She's also a Population Connection board member and we're fortunate to have her leading the way at our organization. CTPH is a Ugandan NGO that promotes biodiversity conservation by enabling people, gorillas and other wildlife to coexist by improving their health and livelihoods in and around East Africa's protected areas. Dr. Gladys has won many awards for her work, including a UNEP Champion of the Earth for Science and Innovation Award in 2021, and a Uganda Veterinary Association World Veterinary Day Award in 2020. She was profiled in the BBC documentary, Gladys the African Vet, and has featured in documentaries on National Geographic, Animal Planet, and Uganda Television. Dr. Gladys trained as a veterinarian at the University of London's Royal Veterinary College, between 1996 and 2000, she set up the first veterinary unit at the Uganda Wildlife Authority. From 2000 to 2003, she completed a zoological medicine residency and a master's degree in specialized veterinary medicine at North Carolina State University and North Carolina Zoological Park. So thank you so much, Gladys, for being here. And um, it, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a great, great webinar and it's great to see the links that Karen has brought up between family planning and environment and climate. Um, I'm excited to be here today and happy Earth Day, everybody from yesterday. I'm going to share a presentation. Um, are you able to see it? <laughs> yes, it looks great. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to talk about our work in family planning and focus on an area that I've been working in for all my working life, which is Wind Impenetrable National Park, home to half the world's mountain gorillas. In this national park, it's a very good example of how it's very population, high human population growth rates have affected the, the forest and the environment. And I'm going to talk about it in the presentation and also talking about what we are doing to link population health and environment to bring about benefits for all. Windy is separated by two, separated, the two gorilla populations are separated. At one point they used to connect. This was, you know, over a hundred years ago. They used to connect. When the Gurunga population was discovered at the beginning of the of the 19th century, 20th century in 19, about 1900s, um, and the wind population was discovered 80 years later through DNA. And of course, the, the genetic analysis was exactly the same. So it showed that at one point, these two forests connected, but they've been separated by urbanization, high human population growth rates, and sadly, they may never connect. But they're the last, the only two strongholds of mountain gorillas in the whole world, of which there are only about 1,000. So I've been working with mountain gorillas for about 30 years, starting out as a vet student. 
um, they are really amazing and there's, I've learned a lot from them, including birth spacing. The mothers, all gorilla mothers space, they have babies once every four and a half years without modern family planning. And it's chimpanzees, it's even longer, five years. So all of this means that actually, if we as humans did the same, we wouldn't get to the stage at which we are right now. It's all very logical. By the time the younger one is born, the older one can babysit the younger sibling and help them to develop. Bwindi is also surrounded by a lot of development and high human population growth. A lot of it has come out because of tourism. Gorilla tourism began um, in 1993. In 96, I was hired as the first veterinarian, the first Uganda's first wildlife vet, because they were concerned that people would make gorillas sick and they needed a vet. But with tourism has come development, urbanization, and higher human population growth rates in some areas. And so you often find that uh, gorillas come go outside the park. They're going to range in areas that they used to range before gorilla tourism began, but they were now taken over by people cutting their habitat, um, taking over their land. But of course, when tourism began and it became a national park, people are no longer allowed to cut trees, but gorillas still go out because now they've lost their fear of people. And so this results in a lot of human wildlife conflict. They eat the bark of eucalyptus trees that they tell people to plant so that they don't have to enter the forest to collect firewood. They eat the banana plants, which obviously that's people's food. Um, and they pre actually prefer the plants to the fruit. And so this is a typical scenario when you're getting to Buindi. It's a very hard edge between the community and the park. The population density is around 300 people per square kilometer here, and it's higher in other parts where mountain gorillas are found in Africa. So this is a typical scenario, which then leads to human wildlife conflict. And uh, this particular baby gorilla got scabies. The whole group got sick. Um, the baby gorilla died, and they got it when they went outside the park to eat people's banana plants. The rest recovered with ivermectin treatment, and then a, a few years later, another gorilla group got scabies because again, they were just bordering the park and they were going out. And so that's when we founded Conservation Through Public Health. Um, we started off as fo focusing on preventing disease, zoonotic disease between people and animals. And our main programs have been wildlife health and conservation and community health. But when we found out that many people are unhealthy because they're poor, we added alternative livelihoods. And actually alternative livelihoods, livelihoods seems to be another key component of population health environment programs. And I'll talk more about how we adopted it even more during the pandemic. And so some of the things that we do is we analyze the fecal samples from the night nest to see if the gorillas are picking up parasites or picking up parasites from people or livestock. And then we're able to analyze them in our gorilla health and community conservation center. We also find that sometimes if they are picking up parasites from people, we also test the people and make sure that they're dewormed because deworming is only available for children up to five years old, free deworming, regular deworming. We also help work with the cattle keepers to deworm their livestock. And this is analyzed at our Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center where we also test gorillas, people and livestock working closely with the local hospitals and the local veterinary agricultural centers. Then we work with gorilla guardians who had the gorillas back when they come out, which is a very important activity. And during COVID, everybody now wears masks who comes near the gorillas, whether they're tourists or gorilla guardians or park staff or vets, everyone has to wear masks when they're within 10 meters of the gorillas. When we started CTPH 20 years ago, we're very happy to celebrate 20 years. We started off with just this group of community health and conservation workers. We train them both to do health and conservation work and we call them community health and conservation workers. But later on, um, actually Dr. Lynn Gafikin here is a PhD fellow. She was a PhD fellow in Madagascar and she helped to set to introduce family planning within our program. And this was a meeting we had at the Kayonza Government Health Center 3. They may, we mainly have health center threes and one big NGO missionary hospital around Windy where 
people can be referred to for family planning services. But as you can see from this photo, we are glad that half our volunteers are men and half are women. It just, it didn't, it wasn't necessarily intended, but when we spoke to the local leaders to select one person from the village who can read and write in, local, in English, and it can be trusted, it ended up like this. And so because we engage, we promote family planning and health, we're privileged to be able to engage a lot of women in our programs. And this lady, Rehema, um, now 15 years since we started the program, she's mentoring these other three ladies and they're carrying out a lot of activities, behavior change, communication. They go to people's homes. They also carry out group talks, talking about the benefits of planning your family because you can send all your children to school. You can give them proper health care and you, they don't have to enter the garden to poach or collect firewood. One of the most popular contraceptive was the family planning injection because people would go to the health center and they find an overworked nurse or midwife. Um, and so they, she doesn't give them anything and they go back and conceive. But working with Family Health International, FHI 360, we were able to be one of their five pilot sites to see the feasibility of getting lay community health workers to give injections. So here Rehema was giving an injection to somebody in her home and it really picked up. The number of family planning users doubled. Uh, we started off with the pills, then with the CB community-based depot, it doubled and it's continued 15 years later. We've been sustaining the volunteers with group livestock projects. Um, they asked for them and this helps to bring them together. And when care came along, they reinvested it in village saving and loan associations because they were training in this through the Bindi and Mugahinga Conservation Trust. And so some of these things have been unintended outcomes, but we're excited that the program, we haven't had dropouts over the past 16 years. So up to now, this lady is still giving these injections and now it's upgraded to Cyana Press. And this is something that has really liberated women. So that the, they're continuing to give these talks about having manageable families. And this is something that is really helping to get people moving. Right now we are able to reach, we started off by having 26 volunteers, but now the number kept growing. And currently right now we're engaging over 400. We call them village health and conservation teams because now the village health system got to Uganda. And when it got to Uganda, we started to engage all village health teams as village health and conservation teams. So wherever they go, they're able to bring across the health and conservation message together, which is so important in areas like this of high biodiversity, but actually in the rest of Uganda, we're actually advocating to the government that all community health workers, village health teams become village health and conservation teams. And we, we, we also work with men actually um, quite a lot. So this is one of our volunteer leaders. He's going to check on somebody's home. We started a new system of model households where a model household should have 12 of the indicators that we want um, so that it's easier to measure how homes are changing over time. Because if a home has good indicators, they're much less likely to poach and collect firewood and go in the forest, and they're much less likely to get sick, and they're more likely to send their children to school and break the poverty cycle. So they're checking to see for hand washing stations and all kinds of things. And these are the kind, this is an area which is really critical on the flip chart. The family that has too many children, when the gorillas come out, they try and chase them away. And then people end up getting hurt, gorillas get hurt, and diseases can be spread. And the human wildlife conflict goes up. And later on, they have teenage pregnancies. The, you know, that's men, children die early. And in the, in the home where they space their children, we actually made it four children, which is pretty good for this area because women were having as many as 10 children, 10 live births. Um, and so when they have four children, then they're able to all go to school. When the gorillas come out, they call out the hu human gorilla conflict team, gorilla guardians to herd them back. And later on, the boy becomes a ranger, the girl becomes a nurse. And of course, they'd rather be the family that everything is going well. We're finding that over time also as community health is improving, gorillas are falling sick less often from human diseases, which is great. This is actually a new baby that was born last week. <laughs> um, just shows you how similar they are to us. And we're glad that the population growth is continuing to grow. This is actually our patron, the Queen of Buganda. She came to open our center officially when we celebrated 20 years of conservation through public health in December. 
And she's an advocate for family planning. She's actually a UN, UN advocate for the girl child. And she's helping to promote family planning and reproductive health rights within Buganda Kingdom, which is the biggest kingdom in Uganda. And having a high profile leader like that to promote population, health, environment, gorilla conservation is very important for the country. And we're pleased that over time, the number of mountain gorillas has continued to increase. I participated in the first census in 1997, and the, the population has almost doubled. And we're really pleased about that. They're no longer critically endangered, but there's still just 1,000 individuals left in the world. We're pleased to have contributed to an increase in the women on family planning. When we started out, it was less than the country average, and now it's three times as much, and it's above the, family, the national average in rural areas. Women are more involved in conservation and men in family planning which is exciting, and women can get up and give a talk, as you saw. Gorillas are better protected in community land because as you improve community health, you improve their attitudes to conservation. We've had a huge increase in hand washing stations, and we've had less, we haven't had additional scabies outbreaks, and Jadia has really gone down. And so this, fit, this fact sheet was developed when we started the PHE working groups in Uganda, this was like around in 2008, 2009. And this evolved into the Uganda PHE network, which is now headed by the National Population Council. So it's headed by the government. So now the government is leading PHE advocacy efforts. So I would say that that time CTPH was the secretariat. And I would say that it was a successful advocacy effort because now the government took over and they often call us to promote population health environment in other areas where we are not working. Um, you know, to, to show people how we're doing it, to, to carry out um, study visits at our place. And the government is really embracing it, which is fantastic. They have a budget for it, and we see that as a, a big success. We're also doing some work across the border in DRC, where people are even poorer. They have even worse health indicators. Um, as you can see, most people have grass thatch roof. In Windy, they're now having iron sheet roof, and tourism has had a lot to do with that. Here, there's hardly any tourists. And in spite of them being largely Catholic, they want access to contraceptives because they want to reduce poverty in their homes. This is actually a kitchen. And so when we started the program there, we try and see how we can link them to family planning providers, but in many places it's not free. But that's an area where family planning programs can really make a difference in DRC. During the pandemic, um, we started to provide ready to grow gardens, uh, ready to grow crops because when a lead silverback of a popular group, gorilla group was killed by a bushmeat poacher, we realized that we really needed to address hunger. The poacher was hunting daikar and bush pig and accidentally killed the gorilla. And we started to provide fast growing seedlings. We now reached 1,500 homes. Most people said they were poaching because they're hungry. And so now this has become a key component of our program and we're scaling it further to another 1,500 homes with support from National Geographic. We also support coffee farmers around the park. Um, these coffee farmers are able to, we decided to engage them because we found out that people are still entering the forest to poach because they weren't getting a good price for good coffee. And so we enable them to get a good price for good coffee. Um, it's hard for them to grow good coffee. So they concentrate on that. They get a very good price and they're able then to eat and send their children to school. And a donation from every bag sold goes to support the community health and gorilla conservation programs at conservation through public health. And we're glad that we also engage women coffee farmers. And so we've, we've seen a huge increase in female empowerment through our work, our PHE and One Health approach. Some of our volunteers have been with us for a very long time, like her, Hope. And now with the model household, we've seen some great increase in the way we're measuring indicators. We currently have over 400 village health and conservation teams visiting over 10,000 households in 59 villages where there's high human and gorilla conflict and they're reaching over 50,000 people, which is wonderful. In, 20, in 2022, we saw an increase in homes that were red in green homes from 22% to 53%. And green homes are the ones that have nine out of 12 of these indicators. Red have up to four. Our orange have up to five to eight, and red have nine to 12. So basically, if somebody's healthy and hygienic, they have a source of income, 
They have a food crop garden. They have great knowledge about disease transmission between people and gorillas. They're much less likely to poach. And this is what we're trying to promote as well as planting trees. And so we're really pleased that through this approach, people and gorillas are benefiting and thriving. And we're hoping that this PHA approach can be scaled up in many places. It is being scaled up in other national parks around Uganda, including Mount Elgon, which has a very high human population density, um, and also in savanna habitats. I was excited to launch this book, uh, Walking with Gorillas, last year, um, talking about my conservation and leadership journey. And there's a whole section on One Health and a whole chapter on population health and environment. And we're so glad that Population Connection has helped to promote the book, has helped to support the book. Um, and you can still read about an excerpt from the book actually written by Marianne, which came out last year. And the book is available on Amazon and various platforms, Barnes and Nobles and various places in U UK, US and other countries. Thank you very much for listening to me today and looking forward to your questions. And you can also buy this coffee here in America, Gorilla Conservation Coffee, and visit us in Uganda and see our PHE work in action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. I, no matter how many times I hear you talk about all of the work that CTPH does, it's still fascinating every single time. It's so many different programs that you're tackling all at once. And that's kind of what we're arguing for here, that you know, tackling challenges that relate to each other can be so much more um, efficient in a way, you know, than than addressing each of them independently. So um, yeah, your your work is groundbreaking and amazing. Um, and I love that you invited people to come visit. Is that a real invitation? <laughs> Can people actually come visit? <laughs> it is. It's yeah. a real invitation. Yep. Come and yeah, see me. Right here. <laughs> I'll go in a couple of days to see the community work as well. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Well, you know, <laughs> contact info here on this slide. Somebody was asking um, for some contact info for the speakers. So you've got Gladys's right there. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, we have gotten a lot of questions. Um, and let me see. Well, I'll just send this one to you, Gladys. Somebody asked, is there a need to integrate population with biodiversity education more? Seems. Yes, there is a need. To, is there a need to in integrate education? Yeah, population and biodiversity education. So incorporating the two and teaching them yes. together, I assume is what this person is asking. Yes, I think there's a great need and it's wonderful that Population Connection is doing that. I'm really excited to be a board member of Population Connection because from where, the areas where we are, from an early age, a lot of girls are married off. Um, once they get pregnant as teenagers, they basically marry them off. And in fact, when we started the program, USAID said to us, they gave us our first funding and they said to us, you can either focus on, you know, teenagers, um, women or men, and with youth, women or men. And we looked around and most of the youth were married off. So we started off with all couples. So we started off with couples. And because we realized that if the men, there's a lot of domestic violence, and if women got us contraceptive without telling their husbands, they'll beat them up and say, why aren't you having children? Then they'll stop taking the contraceptive. And we did find there was a lot of teenage pregnancies. And so definitely if you start to teaching it early in schools, then it's much better. And we going forward as CTPH, we want to start to engage the youth more and you know work with the health groups, the public health groups that engage teenagers and expand our work in that direction as well. But yes, it's really, really important. We we have a we work, we teach kids to learn what we do through sports. And some of it includes population education together with biodiversity education. And we recently started a STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math program, where we also talk about these issues in the schools and in the youth groups. Wow, that's really cool. Are you finding that like cultural norms are changing around family planning and other related reproductive health issues? in the communities where you work? Um, like, is it more acceptable now for women to use contraception? Do they have to hide it less from their partners? It's becoming a lot more acceptable. And um, actually the, the district health officer was very excited. He said, you've helped us to have 
the best indicators. We now have four women, you know, four, the fertility rate has gone down to four. It used to be seven. And he said, we've helped to contribute to that. We've helped to change people's perceptions about the benefits of family planning. We find that women are happy that they don't have to have a baby every year and they're having more control over their bodies. And men are happy that they can balance the family budget better. And so, yes, it's really, we really help to change perceptions in the area. And we're very excited about that. Sometimes I've been invited to give talks at family planning conferences when they're talking about family planning from non-traditional sectors. And yeah, no, people are changing. They're really changing, which is wonderful. Yeah, and I think context is important here too, because you talked about what a success story it is for fertility or for family sizes to go from, you know, 10 to four, um, which of course, you know, in a lot of countries, including the United States, we would consider four children a large family, um, but it's all relative. And that is, you know, incredible progress to have had happen in just two decades. I mean, is that is that is that drop in fertility since CTPH began operations or like what's the time period? Yes, since CTPH began operations in the areas where we're working. Yeah, the areas around the park. So yeah, we're very excited about that. And actually, they, hopefully to keep reducing, you know, like it's four children. And one of our best success stories was a lady who got three girls. And after our village health and conservation teams reached her, she decided not to have any more children. She stopped looking for a boy. She has a shop and, you know, her children are going to, her three girls are, having, are going to have a very bright future, her three daughters. And so those, and her husband supports it. And um, so that's, we're happy to get those testimonies. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah, something to put in your newsletter. I don't know if that was on your last slide, but you send out a regular newsletter that's fantastic. So if anybody's interested in learning more about CTPH and its ongoing operations, um, you can get frequent updates by signing up to their email list. Um, Thank you, I guess yes, if you visit our website, you can, you can yeah. sign in for a newsletter. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll switch over to Karen now and just ask, I don't know why I never thought to ask this question before, but what was the impetus for this report? Why did you all decide now to tackle this um, question together? Oh, I, th I think, again, it's just because there's such toxicity around the topic of population mm -hmm. that it's that it, and population dynamics that it's sort of been shunted aside um, and avoided in, in discussions of global goals and, you know, with the SDGs 2030 coming up and ICPD at 30 and sort of reinforcing, um, you know, Cairo, it just felt like it was really an important time to, um, to sort of try and change, change the narrative a little bit and to, and to really um, sort of highlight that, you know, it's, it's not a contradiction to say that you're for SRHR um, and reproductive health and rights, but also, you know, need to talk about population dynamics, you know, and especially now too is um, because the narrative around population dynamics has become so skewed, um, but that, you know, to, to really sort of have people understand policymakers and the public really understand, uh, you know, pop, population growth, population size, you know, the fact that there's, uh, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is um, you know, um, uh, Gladys was just talking about fertility rates of seven, you know, in the Sahel, it's it's closer to eight, um, you know, and then in other parts of the world where there's, you know, South Korea, where there's, you know, it's it's uh, under uh, fertility rates of under one. Um, and, you know, with that, with those kinds of dynamics that have such an impact, you know, both ways on countries, it, we, we sort of said, we, we can't not talk about population dynamics. Um, and we said, and trying to, to you know, divorce that from talk about SRHR doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help women, um, doesn't, is, is not doing in women any favors um, by, by not talking about population dynamics. So we just, we just felt like it was, and the, you know, the, the Whedon Foundation that, um, that funded, the, um, funded this, this uh, report through Population Matters, I was also very interested in, you know, in this topic. Thanks. How have you found the reception to be? Are people interested and in accepting of what you've written? 
I think for the most part, I think, you know, the feedback has been, has been very positive. Certainly, certainly not everybody. Um, but um, yeah, I think very, very, um, you know, I mean, when it's been presented in, you know, in, in different webinars and, and things, it's, you know, very, very good reception and, and lots of interest in it. That's great to hear. Okay, I'm going to head back over to the Q&A box and see what we've got in here. Somebody asks, how is SRHR associated with population matters and improving the environment? Um, yeah, so I guess just how, how does SRHR population and the environment all intersect? How are they connected? Which I guess mm -hmm. we've both kind of talked about already. Um, and then how to, and then to fulfill gender equality, how key is it to integrate SRHR? Oh, the question just, just disappeared. Um, <laughs> somebody just marked it as done. Oh, okay. Uh, well, sorry. No, I think, so I, I think, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I have to say, Gladys, I'm so glad I gave my presentation before your amazing, amazing pictures of all those wonderful girls. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think, you know, I think Gladys's presentation really shows the importance of, of, of the linkages and, and, um, you know, the, I think the the point that we'd make is that is that yes, individual rights are important. To every and you know, individuals have um, have to decide the number and spacing of their children. But I think what Gladys has shown is when there's when there's sort of education around it, um, you know, people can can make better informed decisions. Um, and that um, we found, you know, through sort of through through the sort of history of the of you know, what's, I guess what's called the population movement. Um, that one, when people, when women do know about access to contraception and use contraception and have have uh, you know to voluntarily decide to have um, smaller families, that does have an effect on on population and population dynamics. And so, while you don't do family planning to have you know to have the effect on population dynamics, it just does have an effect. Um, and so. Um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm always surprised when people say, well, let's not talk about population. And I say, but, you know, everybody's individual fertility decisions add up to a population size. Are we not supposed to, you know, we're we not supposed to be able to add. I mean, it, it seems a little bit uh, so, I mean, I know that's a little bit um, silly, but, um, but yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's what I would say. I don't know, Gladys, if you have any, anything to add about, um, the, about the linkages. Yes, um, thank you, Karen. <laughs> and actually, I'd like just to add that one of our very first staff that we hired at Windy from the Windy community, she, her father had the foresight to educate her. He was a traditional healer and he had the foresight to send all his children to school, both the boys and the girls. Because, yeah. And then she decided to do a bachelor in tourism because guerrilla tourism had begun in, around her community. Mm -hmm. And Vasta had her first child at the age of 25. By the age of 25, most people, most girls have had their first, they've had five children. And by the age of 36, they've had 10 and they're looking much older than they should be. Vasta had her first child at 25, having graduated. She had actually that child when she just started working with CTPH in her first year. And in total, she had four children. Um, um, and this, this is the whole, this is all because of educating, education. Mm -hmm. So I think educating everybody you know not just the boys but the boys and the girls mm -hmm. really makes a difference because once a girl receives an education she's highly unlikely to have a baby quickly and you know she can she has other options in life and mm -hmm. she'll make sure that her children are educated because she's an educated mother and mm -hmm. children spend much more time with their mothers than their mm -hmm. fathers in general um especially in rural areas so so yeah i think the education piece is really important it could be something that is also we, we put more emphasis on in the whole PHA approach. Right, right. Okay, we've got a couple of people interested in particular birth control methods, contraceptive methods. Um, somebody is asking Dr. Gladys whether uh, you use Cyanopress in your programming. And I believe I even heard you mention that specifically. Um, and then somebody else is asking if families have four births and want to stop, do they access vasectomy and tubal ligation? Um, obviously, vasectomy is easier and, and easier to make available because it's outpatient, um, but it needs to be emphasized or the responsibility falls on women usually. Um, so what I guess, could you talk a little bit more about the methods that you offer and whether permanent um, sterilization is one of them? 
Yes, all the, thanks for that question. All the methods are offered. Um, the nearby hospitals can help with tube, with tubal ligation and vasectomy. Not many people take up tubal ligation and vasectomy, but most people end up getting the implants. So by the time, like for example, there was a lady who had had nine children early on in our programs and she decided to use the implant. And I said to her, why don't you have a tubal ligation? And she said, my husband doesn't want me to have a tubal ligation, but it's okay for me to have the implant, which is after five years, she won't, when she hasn't had children, I'm sure they may graduate to the tubal ligation. But we got her to go on radio with her husband and the volunteer to show people that, you know, it's something you plan together. And it also got many people interested in adopting family planning. But all the methods are available, including the IUD. Others go into the IUD. And thankfully, we have a very good hospital nearby, the Bindi Community Hospital. And also the government health centers can offer some contraception. Do but it's have... now um, something that Uganda is beginning to really embrace, which is great. At one point, it wasn't embracing it at all. <laughs> but I've been happy to be there when, you know, it's now the leadership, the top leadership says family planning is fine. And I was glad to be in that conference when we, the president of Uganda said it's a good thing to do, but it should be combined with education and economic development. People should have jobs. <laughs> One of the things that your organization helps people with, with its livelihoods programming. So yes. again, just addressing everything all at once together. Um, <laughs> Let's see what else. Well, somebody asks a question that I have to admit I was kind of thinking too, and it, it is a little bit funny, but um, why aren't people biologically programmed to space children more widely like gorillas and chimpanzees? <laughs> I don't know if you could possibly <laughs> answer that, but. <laughs> um, I think Karen could also answer that. Yeah, I, I know, know, yeah. <laughs> I think as humans, we're just, I don't know, we just, can I say greedy? Or oh, we don't think ahead. You know, we just want everything now, now, now. Um, but I believe that we are, we are supposed to have done that. We just lost that, that innate ability to do things properly, you know, because of modernization, you know that, oh, if I have a child, someone can look after the child. I can go to work, you know, someone will look after the child. But whereas with the great apes, they don't have a choice. It's, they have to look after their child. And so they, but they space properly. And they're making a conscious decision to do that. Obviously, this is not like a biological direction that they're receiving. Like, I, I would say it's it's both because they actually breastfeed for three years, um, exclusive breastfeeding, which humans can't really do because, you know, within a short time, the baby's eating other things and it's not exclusive breastfeeding and the hormones don't work that way anymore. Um, but also it's logical, you know, they don't start, they don't conceive until after three years, because they know that I have to look after this child and then the older one will look after the younger one. So I think it's both. But yeah, no, great apes are amazing. Orangutans also do the same. Um, so obviously we was we are supposed to have done it, but they've, they've gone ahead. They've, in that way, we should be learning from them. They're our great ape cousins who are ahead of us in that area. <laughs> Actually, we spaced our two boys four and a half years apart. And I think that worked. <laughs> I remember you writing about that in your book, actually, and how you've been able to send them to really good schools. And, you know, they've seen benefits from being one of two. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we've got a question here about just the PHE model and um, would a similar approach be valuable and cost effective even in regions that are not high, bi high biodiversity areas? Um, and do you have any examples of this? I don't know if you're familiar with PHE programs elsewhere, but um, either of you, do you know of any that aren't in high in biodiversity hotspots? I think that's where they tend to be. Where they it's tend not, to be. That's right. that's yeah. part of the part of the model. Yeah. But maybe maybe some somebody on the one of the one of the uh, people listening in have have a, an idea and can put it in the chat. Yeah. Please but do. I believe that they they will be beneficial everywhere. They really would. I mean, whatever you call biodiversity, you know, like in, in the capital city of Uganda, people are reclaiming swamps for mm -hmm. buildings. But that's all biodiversity areas and they could all benefit from, you know, even urban poverty could be reduced through bird spacing, you know, having manageable families, not just rural poverty. And everywhere, it's a, there's, we're having environmental issues everywhere, not only in 
the high biodiversity hotspots. Mm -hmm. So from, from the, when you can look at it from the environmental standpoint, I really feel that a PHE model works, especially also when we're looking at climate change, you know, Karen mentioned that as well. So mm -hmm. I believe it can work everywhere. And that's why we get, we're trying to advocate for the government to make all village health teams, village health and conservation teams. And when we celebrated 20 years of conservation through public health, we held a round table discussion and thank you Population Connection for giving support towards that. And this discussion was held in Sheraton Hotel in Kampala and it had people from National Population Council, National One Health Platform, Jengudo Institute, Regenerate Africa and Uganda Wildlife Authority. And we they all debated and thought, yeah, can all village health teams be in Uganda, the whole of Uganda, not only in around national parks, can all of them become village health and conservation teams? And they all mm -hmm. thought, yeah, it could be a good idea and it should, we should go ahead and do it. And now mm -hmm. we're just gonna keep advocating to them and hopefully it will happen. But I think it can happen anywhere in the world. There's a benefits for linking health and environment, health and conservation mm -hmm. in all aspects of life. Yeah. yeah. I, Sorry. I definitely, you go. definitely agree agree with that. And and in I mean, gosh, the you know, humanitarian settings, does disaster disaster settings, you know, building resilience and and the, those teams that go in um, to sort of post disaster resilience, making sure that you know that SRHR is and family planning are part of those responses. Um, you know, can it, it, I think that's also the one of the points we're making in the in the in this in the breaking silos report of look at all of the different frameworks gladys you mentioned one health um you know to, so so we're whatever the framework is srhr and population dynamics can and should be um in, integrated yes definitely that it should be a, a key component of all one health programs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It seems like one of the components of PHE programs, or at least CTPH's um, PHE programs, is having community members themselves be the ones doing the outreach and the education and sort of going door to door. Um, can you talk a little bit, Gladys, about how that has helped the, the model reach more people and be more effective than if you had brought people in, say, from Kampala, you know, um, that were doing all of that outreach themselves? Yes, I think it's so important to have the local people as model change agents mm -hmm. because they're more likely to be convinced by somebody within their village than somebody coming from another part. Um, that has really helped. They're much better at carrying out, changing the behavior within their community than bringing somebody from another part of Uganda. And it's also very much more sustainable because they can relate to these people. In fact, actually, what's interesting is when we started conservation through public health, we gave a skit to drama groups, local drama groups, about what we're trying to address. And they would always refer to people in the community within their skits, you know, because they, if it's I people in the community, they're much less, much more likely to be convinced. And I think that has really helped. Interesting. I kind of, I mean, that speaks a little bit to what Cody said about his organization earlier, Population Media Center, reaching people through storytelling can be so effective, even if you're not you know, being so obvious about your message, um, just showing another way um, through a drama um, or through a play can really broaden people's horizons. Um, let me see, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, well, what else do I wanna ask? I mean, we do have a question here um, asking about university education in Uganda and whether PHE is something that's being discussed there. Um, is this, I mean, I, I don't know of any American universities that talk about PHE programming. We, I mean, we, we have a staff member who goes out and gives presentations to university classes. And my understanding from her feedback that she receives is that she's kind of the only one doing it, but I don't know if, if the case is different in Uganda. Um, I would say it's kind of taught, but not really. But I think it's a good area to move to. I know the universities in Uganda are very excited about our work and they want to send us students, you know, to, to learn about what we're doing as part of their dissertations. But, and with one of them, they want to actually see if we can work together to shape their curriculum. 
And I think that's something that it's a good direction for us to take, actually. It really is. One time, I think about 10 years ago, I got to speak at Duke University. They had like a, a week long of talking about PHE. Um, I'm not sure if they took it up in the end in their programs, but I think it's a way forward for all universities because that's a, a nice place to start really introducing yeah. it in the programs. Mm -hmm. We do host students though who come and study the model um, from America, UK and other countries and within Uganda, but it's it would be great if it actually becomes part of university curriculums. And Karen, as somebody who's worked as a consultant for so many different organizations and entities, is this something that you've seen practiced anywhere? You mean at the, the university connection or yeah. just? The, um, um, yeah. Um, I think, I, th I think again, it's a, there's a huge funding issue related to, related to PHE. It's sort of a bit of a niche area that, um, that you know needs needs more attention needs more um and needs more needs more funding so i think that's sort of the um you know there are su such amazing examples of i mean just look at the statistics of gladys that you have and i know in madagascar you know the tanzania a lot you know lots of countries with really good um good uh good results um that just need to to more attention paid to them, um, but that means we need to take those stories to policymakers. We need to take those stories to, you know, to, you know, to all of the different stakeholders. Um, and again, get the get the different um, communities of, of of interest to 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 advocate for for more integrated programming rather than siloed programming. Yes, or even getting you know like health donors to fund conservation work, yep. and conservation donors to fund health work. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we've, we've been doing a lot of advocating to donors, I guess, to fund the, our model and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beginning to work. And mm -hmm. we just need to, yeah, there needs, there's a lot of donor, as you said, donor education, donor advocacy. That's needed, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then again, just the breaking of the silos, because if you, if you sort of demonize an area, then it becomes toxic, so toxic that other sectors aren't going to want to take it up. So people working on the environment would be like, well, we're not taking up that SRHR stuff. <laughs> Too, too sensitive. Um, so yeah. if we could just sort of de, you know, take the heat down on these topics, it will, I think that will be very helpful. So, so um, yeah, so stories like you're telling Gladys and of this amazing work are really, really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. You're, I mean, CTBH is the first organization that I ever heard of that was doing this type of work. I started hearing you present at the Wilson Center in DC I don't know, in 2007, 2008, a long time ago. Um, and it was, you know, sort of like a mind blowing concept at that point. And now, of course, a lot of organizations have started their own PHE programs and that's really wonderful. But yeah, I think the more that there are that we can hold up as examples of effective programming, the, the better off we'll be, so. Yeah. Oh, and there are lots of, lots of examples from Madagascar and other countries, so yeah. Blue no Ventures, problem. that comes to Blue mind. Ventures, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so okay. the so the lemurs are competing with the gorillas for cuteness, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> um, with just one minute left, I wondered if you both would like to talk about what's coming next for you. Is there anything exciting post breaking silos report or you know at at the at, at Bwindi? Anything mm -hmm. you can share? Um, I would say um, at Bwindi, we want to continue to scale up the, the PHA approach because you know, in Bwindi and other countries that have gorillas and also around the country working obviously with local partners to do this. And then we also have an issue of we run out of space for the gorilla numbers to grow. Um, and so trying to convince people to sell their land, you know, so that we can expand the protected habitat for the gorillas and everybody benefits with increased number of gorillas anyway. And, but one thing I can say is that we've kind of been addressing habitat loss through the family planning programs. It's a longer term way of addressing habitat loss. And that's why it's important all over the country. The government has recognized it and wants all areas, especially where there's high human population density like Mount Elgon to have PHE programs. But also on top of that, we are also raising money to try and expand land around the park. I'm actually just looking at the Wildlife Conservation Network Expo in San Francisco, and I talked about that as well. 
are people like accepting these offers to buy their land? Like, are you having yeah. success? A lot of them want to sell land because it's there's too much human wildlife conflict. You know, like they can't plant crops because mm. not only gorillas. Gorillas are actually not the worst offender, but baboons, bush pigs are even worse. They're more destructive. Um, they they can't actually grow their crops, so they they ha they have to sell it to someone, and they're happy to sell it to the tourist lodges. Mm. Uh, but they just sell it to anybody. But why not sell it to expand the protected habitat? So and also the forests are not only important for the gorillas. And the other important species there, like elephants, chimpanzees, and many species of monkeys. But also, it's a very important water catchment area, you know, and an important climate modulator for the area. So there's there's lots of benefits in expanding that the forest, not only to protect the endangered species which are in the forest. That's really wonderful that that's an effective program. Um, Karen, do you have Just anything? The just to say on the global sort of on the global scene looking at uh, CPD and and um, you know what's what's Cairo ICPD after after 30 you know and moving to the SDGs and just staying in this discussion and getting more people in you know involved in in the discussions and in advocacy thanks yep. we'll be working alongside you doing that so exactly exactly we, we have lots to do on the yeah on, on all levels don't we Mm-hmm. Busy. Um, well, I, that's time. Thank you so much to both of you for joining and thanks for filling the extra time um, left when our other speaker unfortunately couldn't make it. Uh, I really appreciate every everything that you said and the education that you provided for all of us atten in attendance today. So um, thank you so much. And yeah, I don't know. Do you want to, I know Gladys, you put your contact information up. Somebody had asked Karen whether they had, they could contact you. Um, Absolutely, know. sure. Yeah, I think I put my I put my email address, but I can. Do you want me to put it in the Q and A or? Um, how about in the chat? Because I think we can save that afterwards. Oh, okay, I'll do that. Although, yeah. Of course, we have your email, so we could just send that out to people. Too. That's true. You you do. I'll just I'll I'll leave it to you to send it. Out. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll do that. Okay, we'll get in touch with our two speakers if you would like to hear more about their work. And um, yeah, again, thank you all for attending and enjoy. CPD next week, right? Yes. Um, okay, take care. Thank Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Population Connection, Population Media, and Population Media Center, Population Matters, and everybody who's been on the Thank webinar. You. <laughs> Anyone who's coming to CPD, please write to us at Population Matters and let's meet up there in New York. I'll be there, Florence, yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Florence. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.